Um, hello and welcome everybody to this discussion of women in the media. My name is Jane Martinson, I'm the women's editor of The Guardian and chair of an industry body called Women in Journalism. The title of today's debate is a quote from Lord Justice Leveson. His, in his report on the media, um, after phone hacking, he found time to mention the media's treatment of women and minorities. In this he said, even the most accomplished and professional women are reduced to the sum of their body parts in most of the British media. Here to discuss why this should be so and what can be done about it are three highly accomplished and professional women in the media. On my left is Yasmin Alibi Brown, Ugandan born British author and journalist who was the first regular columnist of colour on a national newspaper. She still has a weekly column in The Independent and writes for many other outlets. She's the author of several books. Her latest, Settler's Cookbook, is a memoir that was Radio 4's Book of the Week. On my far right is Jane Hill, BBC News presenter um, who's, who works across BBC One and 24-hour news channel. She's worked on many big stories, including the last two US elections, the Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath, and also the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. She's passionate about the arts. I mention this because in 2009, she was the narrator for Sing for the Cure here at the Royal Festival Hall. My immediate right is Ron K. Phillips. Um, he's a journalist in both print, radio, and TV for more than 20 years, although I find that hard to believe sitting next to her. Since 1999, she's been a correspondent at ITV London um, and has reported on or investigated many big stories. Last year, she won the Amnesty International Award for 10 years investigating the story of the torso in the Thames. Now, I'm going to um, ask a few questions of each of the panellists, although I woke up with a streaming cold this morning, so I'm hoping to save my voice for the next hour. And then I'd really like to open questions up to the floor after the first half an hour or so. Um, Yasmin, the Leveson report um, and its pretty damning indictment of the media wasn't really covered by many newspapers. Why do you think that is? Um, and, why do you, <laughs> and why do you think the treatment of women and minorities is so bad? Well, in a way, I, I almost felt... I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm one of those journalists, and there are many of us, who was entirely with Leveson on what he did and the recommendations he's made. So it's simply not true that the journalists have all gathered together to fight off this horrible man called Leveson. Some of us think there is no other way but to shape up so I want to make that clear. I think, obviously, you know why Leveson didn't only not get enough coverage, but since his recommendations has had some pretty nasty, unfair coverage. And every time we're talking about what we're to do with my industry, they completely misrepresent many of his recommendations. And I think that, in a way, we're behaving even worse than the MPs who got caught with, their, you know, with, with the expenses scandal. But I think I was disappointed in him, in, in Leveson, for giving so little attention to the, the way women are depicted and, and women in the media generally. And almost a line, just a line for the minorities. You know, Hugh Grant will get over it. But actually, the, the pregnant asylum seeker whose house is photographed and appalling things written about her and her children will not get over it, and she has no voice. And I was shocked that so little attention was paid to that. But I just want to make two or three quick points for my five minutes. I think this is a bigger issue than the, than the bits of our body, though that's extremely important. All women always, whether young, old, fat, thin, beautiful, not, um, always are in the media, especially the print media, but also the televised media, as first bodies, then perhaps, perhaps, 
perhaps, at a stretch, brain. Um, and I think we have to kind of look at this. And it isn't just a British problem. It's a, I was in India. I just flew back yesterday. I've known India for years. I found this the most depressing week because all our bad habits here have now been picked up by Indian magazines. And all that stuff about looking at women and bitching about their bodies, which I never saw before in India, is there now. Absolutely there. But I also want to look at how women in the media are treating women as subjects and objects. I've been quite shocked. I declare an interest. Vicky Price is a friend of mine, but this is not why I'm saying what I'm saying. In all the coverage we've had, so many women talking about the, uh, you know, the rejected woman and the scornful woman, it took Margaret Cook, who is not a journalist, to write for me the most moving piece about what Vicky Price must have felt and must have gone through. And this prejudice, this discrimination, that her husband could do whatever he wanted. And nobody wrote articles on, for the sake of the children, he shouldn't have had an affair and dumped his wife. He should have stopped himself. But all of them were saying, for the sake of the children, Vicky Price shouldn't have done this. So I read Margaret Cook in The Guardian. It's brilliant. Um, and two other points. Why do I say how women behave? I'm sorry. This is not, I love The Guardian. The Guardian gave me my first ever column when I, I was 30, say, 37 years old. When I was 37 year old bag, they gave, but <clears throat> I'm just using this as an example. When the Oscars <coughs> night was over, um, there's a piece in The Guardian, as there was in my paper and every paper, looking at the frocks of the women, which I find very distasteful. But <clears throat> Jess Gardner Morley in The Guardian got obsessively focused on Anne Hathaway's nipples. I promise you, I have never read anything in The Guardian like this. Not one, not two, but going on and on about how she was wearing this big dress, and my God, idiotic woman, she was showing her nipples. She had just acted and won an award for Les Miserables. I have once fallen into this trap, <coughs> led on by a female editor. I was asked to do a number on Heather Mills. It's the only time in my journalistic life I did this, and I felt so deeply ashamed. I even wrote to Heather Mills. Why is Heather Mills hated? Why are we all expected to hate her? It's the old Paul McCartney who chased her, who asked her to marry him. Why is she this hate figure? I think we, as women in journalism, have to be very self-critical because we're doing it too. We really are. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Ronka, I know that um, at last year's Women of the Year Awards, you mentioned, you spoke out about ageism in the media, mm. but I also wondered, having worked across print and TV, whether this idea that women have to fight to be treated as brains as well as bodies <laughs> is just as relevant. It's slightly different for us in the media. Um, I think the one thing I will pick up on that Yasmin talked about, I do wonder why female columnists, whether it be in the Independent, whether it be in the Mail, whether it be in the Sun, uh, and every single one of those papers has female com columnists, <coughs> have to be quite so cruel and have to be quite so... I don't, uh, it's all, it is cruel, actually. Cruel is the right word to other women. And Yasmin and I had a conversation before, beforehand about uh, whether, as women, as, and I'm talking mostly about print journalism <coughs> here, people fall into a trap of seeing the world through a 37-year-old white male middle-class man's eyes. Because, believe me, that, that is what the media projects. That, that is the way women are projected. We're all projected as boobs as legs as eyes and almost you know an article can't be written about Obama even in a serious newspaper nothing to do with his wife but yet we'll have a lovely picture of his wife there almost as though none of us would be interested unless we could see a picture of a woman so there is something to be said about that but having said that 
I, I'm also going to defend some of those journalists uh, because, you know, the news industry is about headlines. The news industry is about telling stories in short, snappy, immediate ways. So I'm not wanting to contradict you, but I think even you and I uh, occasionally write articles in a way that we, we grab people's attention and it won't always be, uh, you know, non-sexist, non-racist, non... -sexist, non Ageist. So I think we all have to take that on board. It's an industry that demands snappy headlines and sometimes stereotypes is what I'm trying to say. But I mean, I wanted to talk about figures because I looked at a few figures before I came. I'm one of those people that likes to look at figures and facts. And the 2011 census, there's a one million more women in the UK than there are men. 49% of the workforce, which is quite a high number, are women. And this is interesting, 57, well, just over 57% of all first-class degrees in 2011 were gained by women. So, I mean, that is amazing. And yet, you know, the pay gap between men and women on an hourly rate, it's nearly 20%. Whatever, you know, uh, fear of the uh, pay gap that you're going through, whether it's a CEO down to a cleaner, we're, we're, we still haven't caught up. Uh, there are... You know, we don't need to go there, and Jane and I will probably be asked questions about this, but the older women represented on screen is still a major issue in our business. I mean, it's acceptable to see a 65-year-old man um, with presenting with a 25-year-old woman. And why is that? Why, why can't we see it the other way around? Why don't we break those chains? I don't know. I'd like to hear questions and views from everyone else. I am a big fan of quotas. I believe in quotas. Yeah. And I don't... Thank you. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying let's pick the first five people we see and give them a job as a CEO or as a newsreader or as a correspondent or columnist. That is not what I'm talking about. We have lots of very skilled, very talented, very capable women in every single profession. They're out there. We won't have to look too far. I'm talking about giving the women that are qualified to do these jobs a chance to mentor them. And believe me, don't be pulled into that trap that says men are not mentored. They get their mentoring on the golf course. They get their mentoring at the pub. They get their mentoring, you know, near the coffee. So they get mentored. It's just a different type of mentoring. I'm a firm believer in quotas, and not just for women, but for black people, for, you know, for green people, for Chinese people. I believe that we've waited long enough for people to do these, you know, for this to happen naturally. It hasn't happened. Let's get tough. Let's get tough. That's my thing. Um, I'm also going to say that I'm really disappointed there aren't more black people in the audience here. And I think let's get tough, but let's take charge of our own destinies as women. As, I mean, I'm black, so I'm going to keep saying as black people, but, you know, we need to take charge of our own destinies. Achieving anything in life is hard work and takes effort and takes, you know, being involved. And if we can't be bothered to kind of fight our own corner, then we can't expect other people to fight it for us. As always, I'm over. Whenever I do a live, I'm always <laughs> the one that's over. But... Um, I, I, we are making progress, you know, and you, you, I think about my mum's generation who came here in the late 50s, my mum <coughs> came, um, and my father, and I think, you know, now we have judges, women judges, and even black judges, not always them doing the best, but well, let's not go there, um, <laughs> but women judges, we have priests, we have, you know, so there, there is progress being made, but I like this quote, that we will know that we've um, got true equality when we have as many incompetent women in top jobs as we do incompetent <laughs> men. That's what I like. <laughs> I like that one too. <laughs> Spot on. In fact, that's it. We can all go now. <laughs> fundamental point, isn't it, really? Do you, think, do you think the point, though, about stereotypes and the way women are portrayed early on in their careers, throughout their careers, ends up leading to a situation where you, you've both talked about this ageism in the media. Um, is, is that part of the thing? Is it the way that we're portrayed, the way that we then, you touched upon the way women are then sort of end up writing stereotypical columnists, although I'd like to take up the view about 
women columnists. Um, it, do you think that, that sort of leads to this ageism in, in TV particularly? Can I just say that Yasmin's absolutely right. Sorry, I'm, my mic's not on. Is absolutely right that it's women, the women columnists themselves are the ones that have got to say no more. I won't write that. Um, yeah. And I don't think people would stop buying the newspapers. Uh, so, it, mm. you know, the, 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 the power is with us. I do agree with Yasmin on that front. So I just want to make that clear before Jane answers. Yeah. Oh, there, there's so much there. I mean, the ageism thing, I think Ronke and I probably both have quite strong opinions mm -hmm. about ageism. Um, what I keep coming back to is, for example, that very recent report just in the last couple of weeks, uh, well, Jane will know better than me, but the Women in Power 2013 mm. report, uh, which I'm sure lots of you read lots about, which was, my God, how depressing was that? Um, effectively showing that women in all sections of society in the UK have actually slipped back a bit. It was everything, wasn't it? The media, the arts, sport, uh, the judiciary, the civil service. There just aren't that many women in power. Now, we can say that starts with the fundamental part of democracy. We can start with the fact that we only have 22% yes. women in parliament. And it kind of trickles down from there. And we are so way down the rankings. We're 50-something now. Mm -hmm. There's better figures percentage-wise in Afghanistan. What's no, that 30, about? We're 33. Just it, yeah, no, uh, we went from 33 to 60th. Yeah, absolutely yeah. shocking. And if you didn't get a chance to read it, if you can bear it, just go and Google that report because it is really fascinating. Um, and and it trickles down from there. The the ageism point. Um, I, I mean, I'll pick up more on this perhaps when we hear some of your questions. I'm always very keen to hear questions because I think you guys know what you want to want to hear and what you want to ask and, and perhaps it'll come out in the Q&A section but uh, we are st well, when I say we by the way I'm not just talking about the BBC I'm certainly talking about the media generally and I suppose in particular the, the broadcast media that Ron Kay and I work in uh, why do we still recruit for example reporters in particular I think um, when, they, when they're recruiting a female reporter how she looks is still extraordinarily important. Now, one hopes they're going to recruit someone who can, who can write, who can do the job, who has a decent voice for broadcast. But there is still, still more pressure put on how the woman looks versus a man applying for the same job where the looks just aren't as important. And that's, if you're getting it wrong when you're recruiting someone in their 20s, then by the time you get to, I'm 43, by the time you get to our age, a bit older, well, hello. Funnily enough, there aren't that many women left to, to do my sort of job, to be news presenters, because you've recru if you've recruited them for the wrong reason in the first place, then once their looks start going, well, of course you're going to bin them. So if they, can't, if they can't write or if they're not as good as the man because you've recruited wrongly in, in, in the, the get-go, that's, that's how we end up with the situation we're in. And I don't know, is that changing? I don't know whether that's changing as much as it should, as quickly as it should. Mm. Uh, and, and a very quick point about um, the sort of uh, women being their own worst enemies. You didn't quite use that phrase, Yasmin, but I know, that, I know exactly what you mean. <sighs> I hardly almost know where to start with that one. And, it's, and there's an element of truth in it, of course. Um, it's, utter, it's utterly depressing. I've never worked in print journalism. I've only ever done broadcast. So it's quite hard um, to get the same grasp on this as, as Yasmin and Ronke will have you worked in papers a bit um, but uh, yes of course as a woman just as a woman irrespective of where I worked uh, it is deeply depressing to open a newspaper and see someone a woman being hypercritical of other women of course it is the flip side if you want to play devil's advocate as we were saying before we came on Ronke Ronke We've all, got job, we've all got mortgages to pay. We've all got a job to do. If your editor says, I want X slant on X story, are you going to tell your male editor to go hang himself when you've got to pay the mortgage? Very, very difficult. Not trying to make excuses. I'm just saying I've not worked in newspapers and I don't know what kind of pressure some of those women might be under. Yes, yes, yes. I think Yasmin maybe yes, was about yes. to tell us. Um, I would, yeah, okay. You, you could I mean, I think that. there is a, there is a, a difference. I, I have never argued that because I'm Asian and black and a woman, therefore I have a responsibility never to criticize people from uh, those people. I mean, as a journalist and a columnist, mm. I've got to have a very clear mind and a very fair 
way of approaching. Otherwise, I could never do, for example, stories about forced marriages or whatever. And sometimes we have to criticize. I've just criticized women now, including myself. The problem is when you are asked, as I was in the case of Heather Mills, to do a number on her. Mm. And that is what I think is wrong, to do a number on anyone. And it doesn't happen in the quality press that much. This wasn't for the Independent, incidentally. It wasn't <laughs> for my main newspaper. It was when I was working on The Standard as well. And, um, and I just felt so bad afterwards that actually, you know, I wouldn't have been sacked if I said, no, I don't want to do that. Mm. I just can't do that because that's not what I believe. But there was a moment of cowardice, you know, and it happens to all of us. So I want to be able to be critical of women, but I want us to do it for the right reasons, not in the way it happens mm. now, I think. Can I, I mean, I'd like to say a few words and then maybe we can have some, some questions, particularly on this, the issue of um, women columnists, I think it's really interesting. Um, I think there is a, and the Leveson report talked about the mail particularly, there's some really interesting things about that. I mean, it was in the Daily Mail that um, the first sort of the Linda Lee Potter school, I think we can call it now, you know, who's, she's often described as the great Linda Lee Potter, who, who made a name and a fortune um, writing scathing pieces, often about other women. Um, I personally think when women write in a scathing tone about other women, everybody jumps on them and sees them as bitchy and yeah, horrible. Yeah. The reason women are seen in this, like, like Heather Mills, wasn't that one piece by Yasmin, it's because every single... Sem it's, we live in an 80-20 society in journalism, and that goes across uh, newspapers and broadcast. 80-20 is roughly the spit of the people you see, the people you read about, and the people you hear and quoted or mentioned. That, that, that's across the board. And there were, you know, four times as many men writing about Heather Mills as there were just Yasmin. The other thing I'd like to say, and just, I know Jess obviously is a, a colleague of mine, but there's a very interesting thing about fashion and, it, and image. And I think, to the piece I read, Jess was talking about how Anne Hathaway had used a particular material which we, no, we wrote about how it was sort of designed to look like that, but every other paper, it was a slightly, she was trying to go for a tone which said, but of course it's now known as the nipple dress. Now obviously it didn't really work, if even you sort of felt that she was being, you know, focusing on the nipples, but that she was trying to do, I think sometimes, you know, that's the sort of sense of trying to have your cake and eat it, but it was the attempt to say, this is why it made a, made a fuss. The last thing I'd say, and it's, but it's all on the same point of image, is that when, um, at which we did a big research project on front pages, and that the interesting thing we found about imagery on the front pages, so you don't have to read, there are nine national papers, including all the tabloids, um, including the Financial Times. You took all nine every day for a month, and of the top 10 pictures on the front pages, there were only three women. And I don't know if you've read the research or whether you can guess. Kate Middleton. Yeah, that was for, so the most, the most uh, photographed, Middleton. Kate Middleton. Probably one of the posh spice. No. no? Very close to Kate Middleton. Um, Pippa. 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 Pippa Middleton, Pippa. sorry. And the third, yeah. the third, now this, it may have been an unusual month. I don't know if Jane can guess. Madeleine McCann. Oh. So, but this was last year, last spring, and, and what we, uh, the seven men in the top ten, Jeremy Hunt, senior politician involved in a scandal, Nicholas Sarkozy, about to be elected, Simon Cowell, just written a biography, all there for very serious professional reasons, whether good or bad. And I, that was the most shocking part of the report for me, because to me, the image, if, so my daughters, I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, they may not read any of these papers, you know, at the moment they only read The Guardian, obviously. Um, but they look at those pictures and their role models are two women. Well, one who married well, one who's related to well, that's a verb, and another one who's a victim of an absolutely hideous crime. So as, in terms of role models, we, we have a long way to go, I think. Anyway, I have lots of questions as a typical journalist, but I thought I would first try to open it up to the floor to see what you would like to ask um, these three women. So please, hands up if you can. Why don't you we can, stand we can up see you behind the floor. Stand up, up. Yeah. If, if you can, I don't know if we've got mics, so if we can just shout. 
But if you can a just. Lady there as well. Could you maybe shout? If you shout, and we can might be able to relay or? it. Why is there still page three? Why are there still page very, three? Very, very good question. Yeah, is that yeah. Your question? Yeah. How can depressing you, is that? Can you hear us all all right, by the way, at the back? Yeah, yeah. fine. Why, um, why are there still page three, oh, girls? Okay. Yes. Well, apparently answer. Rupert Murdoch promised a couple of weeks ago, didn't he? Mm. Um, mm. Uh, but don't hold your breath. Uh, it's mm. for a daily wank. What else could oh. it be? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of any other reason, can you? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely... Do you know, it's a question that struck... Mm. I've got no idea. I mean, yeah, I don't um. have an answer to it because I'm not a male editor and I don't understand why men... Sometimes, actually, and I, you know, I read every single newspaper like you guys probably do, the, the headlines that they have with them are hilarious. Have you ever seen them? They'll say, you know, that someone's... That, that she's got some opinion on oh, Iraq or something. It's really it's so <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just, I don't know. And I don't know. I mean, I've got lots of men in my life. I don't know any men that would, their lives would come to a stop if they didn't have a paid three girl on the, you know, in the sun. I, I really don't know. I don't know the answer. By the same token, I would love to think that we could legislate against it, but of course we can't. Mm. A, because those of us who are good journalists believe in a free press. Mm. B, you know what, even if you didn't believe in a free press and you just thought this is so offensive, which of course it is, mm. that we should legislate, what would you say? How would that legislation be framed? And it would say, no topless women. Well, they would just print a picture of a woman wearing the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little strip of fabric you've ever seen and they'd get round the, the legislation that way. I, and I, I'm depressed to say I don't know... Mm. how we ever get round that but I think it's embarrassing for a civilised country in 2013 it's embarrassing we I mean I think the simple answer has been uh, that they've always the long believed it was apparently um, brought in by the first editor against Murdoch's wishes which I'm not sure if I believe but it made money it was always seen as the reason the sun sold millions now you know it seems pretty archaic and I think the interesting thing about that is, one, there's been a, a really quite successful online petition, No More Page Free, yes, which is brilliant. Yeah, um, yeah mm -hmm. worth a clap, because they are brilliant. And, um, and also, the, the Murdoch tweeted that in response to a woman who'd signed that petition with something like, I can't remember now, I did write the thing, 23 followers living in Dorset. She emailed, she, what, as, as part of the campaign, she tweeted him saying, why do you still do this? And he tweeted back to that woman, just obviously didn't, you know, just sort of, it was one of those moments in a cab somewhere on his limousine. Um, and he said, um, he said, I don't know why, but it is a bit uh, dated, but he did use the word slightly scarily that we might replace it with glamorous fashionistas <laughs> instead. So I'm not sure if it's um, going to be 100% better. I just also want, if I can, we have to make a distinction between the newspapers we have. I mean... The Independent has more um, women who write about broader subjects and the, the Guardian too. You know, we've got Polly Toynbee, we've got Zoe Williams, we've got um, Christina Patterson and we write about all of this all of the time. And, the, and that, so in a sense we're kind of in an industry which is from one end to the other so different. Um, although we can slip up and I've said we do. But really, sometimes I wonder if we're the same species, even. That when I look at the sun and then I look at some of our other papers, though the leakage, Sunday papers especially, you can see, you can see the images that are appearing in the so-called serious papers. Yasmin, you've got to, the thing is, is that, you know, we have to have some kind of discussion because the independence... What, what is your reach? How many is the independent selling as opposed to the sun that's still selling about six million? Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I, I mean, what is the answer? I don't know. They're selling six don't million, you're sun. probably selling 600,000, <laughs> but six million people are. Mm. So, you know, it, it's not good enough to kind of say, No, but what I'm saying different. is, no, that's not, the that's answer, not what I'm it? saying. I'm saying that in spite of that, and mm. actually I feel very proud that in spite of that, the Independent hasn't got a page three girl. Oh, no, I agree. So I think we have to also remember that there are things that are happening at one end of the spectrum which are heavily criticised and critiqued by the other end. But the leakage is genuine and, and it's happening and it's globalising. That's the most depressing thing. Yeah. You know, that we're mm. sending this mm. filth abroad now where mm. it never was. Mm. Um, there was a... a 
woman over there. She's got the microphone, but it's it not working. Is it working? Oh, yes. yes, we can. Yes. I think it's just it's symptomatic of a general problem with media because it's not just page three. Because when Reva Steenkamp was killed, she was on the front page in a bikini pulling it down yes. on the sun. So that's problematic generally. It's a general problematic view. I know you ladies work in the industry. And it gets to a point where if your editors are saying this is what sells, you, you're forced to write it. It's not, it's not necessarily women shouldn't be the ones responsible. It should be everyone. It should be editors making these calls and us as a population to stop buying it. Yeah. Don't read the Daily Mail if you ob object to female. As the, the, I don't know, that ladies thing. Don't buy it. They won't print it. Don't buy a tabloid. Don't buy um, those, what those, oh, I don't know, the tabloidy magazines with the women on the cover they've gained weight lost weight whatever don't buy it they won't print it it's capitalism that's how it works so just stop and they think that's what women want to read so they print more of it mm. that's how it, these things work it, it's it boggles the mind why but this is the way it is and if we don't change it as if there's so many women here who are interested in it who clearly have a vested interest in it so we should all be saying this stop buying it they won't print it they'll start printing things we want to read so, for example, Stylist, the free magazine they give out every week, that is like a feminist undercurrent kind of guerrilla magazine they're giving out for free, but it's so feminist in the way that they talk, in the way they use those words, in the way that they portray women. This is the kind of media, and it's so popular, this kind of media people want. So it's, it's almost, if you don't buy it, you know, it won't be in demand and supply. It's, it's quite simple, really, I think, anyway. Yeah. Is there anyone else with a question? Just swallow it. Do you want to make a, a comment to that? Yeah. Is there, right, two arms You're there, the one at the back, we can one at the back and then the one in, this, in the middle. Do you want to say something in response? I was to say that, you know, that another solution, an obvious solution, is more, is more getting more women into senior roles, into editorial roles, because one hopes if women are in those senior editorial roles... Okay, yes. <laughs> it doesn't happen. That, that, uh, what do you mean? It doesn't happen. Well, there, doesn't aren't, there are no, hardly they, any female newspaper get... editors in Britain, though. Yeah, but when there are, well, I didn't see the values changing. I have to. I sadly report this fact that women in charge, again, it's to do with market forces. Mm. You know, it well, ain't necessarily so. Doesn't I mean, it? I, doesn't I, it I relate to work your in point. television, and my editor in chief is a woman, and she's only in her mid forties. And she's a feminist, so um, she um, is not. She's tough, but no tougher than having a male boss. Uh, but is but it it's television, and, uh, and I will admit that television can yeah, be no, is it different. But, yeah. I mean, it's also your point about you know um, it we'll have true equality when there are as many incompetent women accepted as incompetent men, and where you have. I mean, I, I think Sarah Sands, for example, the Standard is making a difference and writing more stories that are sort of pro-women, their feminist take. But, of course, The Standard did have a female editor. Yeah. Um, I do, you know, you'd also say, well, we have a woman who's an editor of the, of the Daily Star, the only national newspaper with a woman, obviously not putting a feminist perspective on the news, whether they do news at the Star. <laughs> um, but I would, the, the point is, I think, that if we had more women at the top, you wouldn't say, well, you're a woman, this is what you should do. You would just have more people with a female perspective exactly and that that's might what it think is. it's like having more black people you just you know yeah. we all want to we all see reflections of ourselves yeah. in our work don't we and, have a um, and I think the biggest problem is is that women start off that, that there are enough women coming into our profession whether it be print radio or television but mm. we meet an untimely end we just all I don't know where do we go when oh, we no. get to 50. That's another, that's another, another we huge cannot topic. forget. Let we cannot <laughs> let this moment pass without remembering, in some sorrow, Rebecca Redhead yeah. Wade, yeah. <clears throat> who was the most powerful yeah, I agree. newspaper woman. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did she change anything? No. No. That's no, true. Because yeah. she had, she was looking at the bottom line, <coughs> as she would, because she was running a tabloid newspaper. Yeah. One hopes Two. if she was running BBC News that she might have done differently. Thank God she wasn't running BBC News. <laughs> <laughs> the Sorry, ladies been waiting very patiently at the back with the mic. Hello. Can I just ask the panel what they think about Hilary Mantel's recent commentary on the Duchess of Cambridge? Really and personally, I think how the politicians got it completely wrong. Absolutely. And what you think her message was, please. Thank you. Who won't say that first? Do you want I don't mind taking it first. I think if people had read the comments properly, then um, they would have understood 
that she wasn't making nasty, bitchy comments about Kate Middleton. She was asking us to take a look at the way the media reflects and reduces women or, you know, members of the royal family to their some body parts, a bit what this, um, you know, the, the title of this panel. So um, I heard, I don't know if you heard Radio 4, I listen to the Today programme every day, so Hilary Mantel was actually on there yesterday, I think, wasn't she? Actually explaining what she meant, but as, as is always the case, it, you know, the, the newspapers went for the headline, not the entire story, uh, and then people pick up on the headlines and the, um, the truncated version of what she'd written and, um, and get the wrong end of the stick. And actually, she, she wasn't saying that at all. And, um, and I think she's brilliant, actually. She's a brilliant writer. Um, and I've, I've enjoyed thoroughly both her books. And she's a very, very talented historian. There we I, are. I, I, I thought it was a That's disgrace the way Cameron and Ed Miliband, yeah, and they on the both of them, yeah. jumped in there absolutely not either aware of and the most hideous thing was I was on the Jeremy Vine show arguing about this with some idiot boy who was <laughs> royal watcher and um, he went on about oh it was all to do with the fact that Hilary Mantel <coughs> is such an ugly woman and that that was why she was jealous of um, I mean who was he insulting most I don't know and needed publicity I mean Honestly, <laughs> where do yeah. we go from here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. needed publicity. Yeah, poor Hillary hardly <laughs> sold any books recently. <laughs> yeah, uh, we all feel sorry for her. And uh, in fact, I think I'm pretty sure she was on front row on Radio Four last night as well. And I only heard part of it. But if you're not sure, just listen back on iPlayer. You only have to hear about three sentences from someone as articulate and fabulous as her, and she had made complete sense. And also, it ties into that slight thing. I mean, you're right to make the point that politicians jumps on it too, but it also, I thought, fed into, A, great, we can print loads more pictures about of Kate Middleton, because she said this, and, and B, Hilary Mantel is so on a high... What an extraordinary few years she's had. <coughs> and we know what the media does in Britain when someone's doing really well, we like to, like to knock them down. And it was just a double whammy for the press in particular because they could print more pictures of a beautiful duchess and they could slag off someone who is being incredibly successful. Well, maybe they should try writing a book a winning novel. Um, double. double Good night. Before, before taking the next question, can I ask, I mean, the, the person who asked the, um, asked the question, you agree, obviously, with that, the view of Hilary Mantel, if you have to... Yeah. 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 Just let the actual talk allow it to be fed through and to understand it a bit better. Yeah. A lot of people didn't understand it, fair enough, it doesn't always come to everybody, but it was just, I was so gobsmacked how the politicians got it so wrong yeah. again. Thank you. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a woman sort of in the middle here, had her hand up earlier. Hi, um, thank you for talking. Um, I'm a young woman who wants to go into journalism and I'm, I'm trying my best to break it into the industry, but what I find is that there is this inherently quite sexist culture. Um, and sort of what tips and advice, because we're the next generation coming in, we might actually be able to change something, but it's hard to do that when you have to break into something with certain values. What sort of tips and advice would you give to people who you know, want to write but don't want to do it in a way that objectifies women or, or want to get a job somewhere high up and, and don't want to do it wrong? <laughs> writer <laughs> yeah. I'll just tell you I've all, I always wanted like you to be a writer and a journalist but I was an immigrant who knew nobody when I came here in 1972 I, I had no it's a very nepotistic industry and it was then I was 37 that I finally thought if you don't do this now you'll never do it so I wrote a column I mean the goal of it and I had a friend who worked at the Guardian called Aidan White, who used to, I used to teach adults, women adults in particular, who wanted to get back into the workplace in an adult education institute. And he used to come and lecture. And I, I wrote this. He said, okay, I'll have a look at it. 
meet me at this petrol station. I'm going on a holiday. So I whizzed off to the petrol station. He read it, sent it to the Guardian. It was published. Now, luck had a million things to do with it. But what also helped was thinking myself into this person who could write. And there were terrible times along the way, and I actually owe The Guardian because all well, my first work was with The Guardian. And I was already too old. 37 is, you know, you're, you're almost dead as far as the media is concerned. Uh, don't ask me how old I am now. Um, and it's that. And we live in times where it's more possible to do that because the marketplace has opened up. But the one thing, I've, uh, you must tell yourself, I want to do this and, f and, and find a way of doing it. And all my mentors, I'm also sad to report, except for one, have been men. They've always given me a leg up. So they're not all just waiting to crush women. And almost all of them were feminist men. So, you know, just that drive inside you is really important. I'd also and say, because I, I, I was media editor before uh, becoming women's editor, and I, about five years ago, grew terribly depressed about the state of our industry, um, which is incredibly difficult to get into. Uh, the local newspapers, which fed both national titles and most broadcasts, um, organisations, are dying. And so your entry points, unless you're mate happens to edit something or your dad are really really hard um, however in the last couple of years and I think particularly because of a wave of feminist activists and organizations who have taken to the web to really to write stuff yes. they've done blogs they've they've used Twitter I mean if you look there's loads of examples but look at um, Laura Bates in everyday sexism you know, she wants to break into journalism. She's now written loads. She's written for The Guardian. She's written for The Independent. She has a hashtag campaign that's been brilliantly successful. She's 25. You know, I think, I think if you really want to do it, and that's always been the case with journalism, if you really want to do it, you can do it. It's really hard, probably harder than it ever has been. But with the, the web, I think there are ways. On the sexist point, I think you've just got to keep... You, I think you have to be pretty tough to be a journalist anyway. You have to just keep with your own views and don't let anybody get you down, really. And I would say, if you really, uh, similarly, if you really want it, actually don't be put off by the feeling that you might have anyone in the audience who this applies to who might, might want to get into it. I know Yasmin makes the point, it's, uh, it's an industry with nepotism in it. It is to a degree, but I've been at the BBC a very, very long time, and I think that has lessened and lessened and lessened every year. The BBC is not rammed with people from Oxbridge. I know the Daily Mail might want you to think it is. I work with them, I tell you, it isn't. Of course, there are a few, but it is not the majority. Lot. Not well, not in my newsroom. It's not actually. Um, I mean, there are some, but it, but it's not a lot. And all I would say is, I didn't come from a rich family. I came from a family with no contacts, no background in journalism whatsoever. My dad was a local government officer. My brother and I were the first people in our family to go to university. And all I ever ever wanted to do was work in radio. I totally love radio. And if you love it that much, which I did and still do. Yes then it can, it can happen. I do work with people who are like me and did not have any kind of background or family connections. So please don't come into it thinking, you know, that your dad, because your dad wasn't the editor of the Times, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> um, will you email me as well? Okay, now we can carry on. Um, another question. This lady with her hand up in the middle here. Someone with the mic. Um, I, I wanted to come back to this point about um, the female editors of these tabloids not being feminist. And isn't that because the tabloid environment is kind of cutthroat and aggressive and would do... So the kind of woman that would thrive in that and make it to the top is not ever likely to be a feminist. So like, isn't more the question, like, how do you make... The tabloid media not so aggressive and well yeah cutthroat and difficult to thrive in if you have values outside of that mm. um Yasmin, you want to say no, that? no i think that's a good point but i i think the the change possibilities may lie with changing the men as much as the women that that there are now and there is now a generation Maybe we're, we have two generations 
of men who, who do think differently about women, who may not be as feminist as we'd like them to be, but certainly they, the way they think is very different about their partners and particularly about their daughters. And I think with exactly as with black politics, alliances are central to the big changes that need to be made. And alliances with good men in the industry seem to, seems to me a very important thing we need to be doing. And particularly in the tabloid, I mean, some of the tabloid journalists I know aren't really tabloid journalists at heart. But that's where the job is, that's where the big money is. And some of them feel quite mortified, actually, about what's happening on their papers. So if there was an alliance, a broader alliance, of anti-sexist men and women, maybe, I'm just thinking aloud now, maybe we'd have a little bit more success. I don't know. It's a thought. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a difficult one, because I think everything you said is right. But I don't think... Because even... Uh, you have to be fairly aggressive and fairly cutthroat to be a journalist anyway whether you're you know you have to be tough I suppose we we package it as being tough but across the medium you have to be fairly tough and cutthroat but I don't necessarily think that means you have to be mean or sexist or racist so I, I, I'm not sure the two things equate I don't think you know you take away the aggression um, and you end up with this wonderful newspaper because I think um, you know, I, I'm pretty aggressive about, about my job and about being, you know, the best and getting the story and being first. Uh, you know, we all are. So I think taking that away doesn't necessarily then give you a fantastic paper. So I agree with you, but not entirely, I'm afraid. I, I suppose there's also there's, the issue of culture is quite important. And if, you, if a culture of a place that you have a job in is... is dominated by a certain type who believe that the way of making that paper better is to do certain things. That's quite hard for anyone, particularly women who uh, tend to be in the minority, to fight against that, I think. Can I... I this is slightly cheeky, because I know there are other people, so that lady with the red arm, perhaps next. But can I just... Because we talk a lot about newspapers already. There's just one thing that I have been thinking about with these questions. So... I mean, generally, there are more women in senior um, positions, although that does not come through in news reports to the number of women who are interviewed on the TV. Oh, no. as, as experts, you mean. As experts. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. But the other question about the culture of uh, broadcasting, mm -hmm. and this is interesting because of what happened with Jim, the Savile affair, loads of women there, and a real sense of a culture that sort of didn't get it, didn't just ignore that, that quote from... Um, uh, the editor of Newsnight, where he said, we didn't run the stories because it was just the women who, who said that Jimmy Savile had done these terrible things. And that sort of opened the can of worms, that, that a sort of senior producer could say that just the women. Is that, I mean, the, the culture of, of broadcasting, does that not, that must still be male dominated for that sort of thing to happen is that do you not I think, think it goes without saying that there are more men still in even in tv in senior positions yes i have a female editor-in-chief and there are definitely quite a few women in mm. senior positions but i mean overall i would say yes it's still dominated by men and that comes through i would also say that our industry generally is still dominated by oxbridge actually and, and and i would disagree i mean i'm an exception to the rule i'm black i was working class i come from a you know dysfunctional mad family <laughs> but you know but there are always exceptions to the rule but i think generally actually the industry is still dominated by men it's still dominated by white middle class men and it's still dominated by white middle class men who've been to oxbridge um so, so, yeah, I, I can fully understand an editor saying that kind of thing, but I come from a school where I'm pretty tough mm. and that there are enough women in my newsroom who are pretty tough. That, um, and, of course, ITV did run with the Savile story, um, and I think that is because we've got the balance of tough women slightly better at ITV, and it's not such a corporate organisation. Jane, I'm slightly unbiased. Do you know what I mean about that, Jane? I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, yeah. um, I think they're... Well, we're, big, we're bigger and therefore, by definition, yeah. more bureaucratic and... Yeah, 
all the good and bad that comes with being a very big organisation. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Um, you're right in terms of culture. There are, I mean, at the general level, when I sort of talk generally, I mean, my newsroom is, I don't know, 100, 120 people, maybe, let's say something like that. And the newsroom is very even in terms of the gender split, for sure. And, and it has been throughout my career. When you go but, to management. No, exactly, that's what I'm about to say. There, <laughs> when you get to the higher level, there are still more men. I mean, the head of, the head of news at the moment is a woman, um, but there are, there are more men. Um, She's acting. And look, you know, you could speak from my perspective. The, you know, there are, they are straight men as well. You know, I speak as a gay woman. You know, there's a lot of... There aren't that many um, very, very senior gay people either. So, you know, there's issues at, at, at every level. Uh, that, but the one thing before the one thing I would say is also, if some you know BBC board was sitting here, they would make the point, and probably any media organisation would make the point that the media reflects society. And I get depressed as hell about page three and all the things we've talked about. To what extent? I mean, I'm playing slightly devil's advocate here, but to what extent are we there to change the structure and to, to fight against the bits of society that are wrong? Uh, and to what extent do we just reflect society? And that ties into the whole question of ageism and why, you know, so the media why we don't have all the older women the on telly, all that sort of oh, thing. The media doesn't reflect. I'm not excusing it. I'm, it's, I'm no, just, what I'm saying yeah. is the media She's doesn't on. reflect no, society. No, no, because we, who, your I meant in terms of things like obsession with looks. No, that kind it of doesn't thing. because the media creates those expectations. And you know, well, dare I Harriet, say, the print media does. Harriet, Harriet Harman has just set up this commission. Harriet Harman has just set up this really important commission oh, yes. for um, representation. You know, who is on the programmes? Who is presenting the programmes? Yeah. I mean, I have been on Question Time and Any Questions, but not very often. You can watch those programmes and listen to those programmes and Newsnight. And all those key programs, and you would not know there were women in Britain today, mm. except those donning bikinis, you know. And so the BBC's got a lot to oh, change. No, no. Absolutely, I, I'm not, not trying. To, don't get, don't misunderstand no, I me. Not, I was not trying to be an <laughs> apologist because the one thing I am asked about constantly at the moment, and it, there's been a real spike actually, in, even in the last six months. I am constantly asked about the lack of women on the Today programme. I've never worked there. I have nothing to do with the Today programme. Getting up at that time in the morning would fill me with total horror. I have no interest in working there because I'm not an early bird. But uh, constantly I am asked, and not just in relation to the fact that Sarah Montague is the only female presenter. I'm asked, in fact, even more yeah. so about the guests. And we don't have a leg to stand on. It's a very difficult conversation to have. Yeah. Um, lady at the back now there's only there's less than 10 minutes to go so i think it's probably time for the, the, the first woman who put her hand up and then two more questions this lady here and then there, someone actually. else the first one had a red arm that's it <laughs> hi there sorry i'll stand up red top, um, obviously there have been conversations previously about how we can change the structure of um the way we run parliament in order to encourage women to participate more so kind of removing late sittings things like that job shares are there any ways that we can structurally change the media in this country to make it easier for women to work in it at a high level for longer in the roles that we all want so much? Good question. Um, Ron, could you want to...? Well, I think that structurally lots of um, different professions have to change to accommodate women, to accommodate women's... They call them career breaks, but, you know, women have children, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they become brain dead. So I, I have lots of friends who have spent their sort of early, late 20s, early 30s achieving quite high positions um, within newsrooms or within the industry, and they go off for a year... Uh, and they come back and somehow they never quite reach the pinnacle of the, you know, that they'd reached beforehand. So I think we need to... And, and I know some people think, well, why should they? I don't take a year off work. Why should you be able to? So, but, but I think that actually it, it's almost like why would we want to lose all that expertise, all those skills, all that talent that we've invested in for so long? Why can't we work out a way to bring them back into the fold and bring them back at the, uh, the same sphere as they left. So I think structurally all professions need to accommodate uh, women. And it goes back to what I said about believing in quotas. I, I, I think along with the quotas, we need to change 
the way we think about work and the way we think about expertise and the way we think about skills and the way, at the, the structure at the moment, women are always going to be at a disadvantage, in my opinion. Always. Yes, I honestly think that we've been faffing about for so long mm. in Britain that you look at America and you look at Britain and what changed the top most, you know, the most influential uh, uh, sort of structures and, and positions in America was positive discrimination. There was no faffing. I know there was a lot of resentment, and maybe now the time has come for America to ease off on it, but it created the dynamic for irreversible change. And we have positive discrimination in this country, absolutely. It is for, absolutely, middle-class Oxbridge men. Their friends promote them for being nothing other than middle-class Oxbridge men, and the cabinet too, let's face it. So, I think it has to be a tough, positive discrimination policy, and not for people to run away from those words as if it's the plague or something, you know? Just like people don't want to call themselves feminists, if you say positive discrimination, there is this panic. Why? Nothing will change unless we have this, actually. And, and, and just, just on that note, it's interesting as well. I mean, it's up to you to decide how much role, what, what sort of role you think politics and politicians should play in that. But I was chairing a big conference on Thursday to do with International Women's Day. And as part of that, I had a half-hour interview with Maria Miller, who is Secretary of State for Culture, obviously, but she was there in her role as Minister for Women <coughs> and Equalities. And you can bet your bottom dollar, I asked her that question uh, about four different times in four different ways to try to get an answer. And uh, she's totally, she's not in favour of quotas at all. She made that clear. And her, to paraphrase a half hour interview, her basic gist was uh, she had never experienced sexism within Parliament. She found it fine getting into Parliament. Um, you have to be quite tough to get into Parliament anyway, so it's kind of okay when you get there because you're quite tough. And the government was doing lots of voluntary things. And I just said, well, don't, don't some of these need to be obligatory? Do not some companies, corporate world, everything, not just the media, do there not need to be some things that are obligatory, that are not voluntary anymore? Because it ain't happening. To go back to where we started, we have 22% female MPs in the British Parliament. And her basic gist was, it, things are getting better, it will get better organically. Mm. <laughs> now, I'm afraid I think it's probably just... Okay, we'll do really two very quick questions with maybe one answer from the panel. There was the, the lady here who put her hand up there. And then this, the woman at the back, that's it, with the black, black dress. Uh, so just short question if you can, because I'm being waved at. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm from Sweden, and there's been quite a big campaign in Sweden at the moment about like, uh, ha uh, hatred that you get, kind of like emails or like online for people that are... Like, in media and that type of thing. I was just wondering if that's something that you face a lot, kind of emails or over social network and that type of stuff. Um, we'll take the other question and then Yasmin, if you can answer that, because I think that's particularly the comments underneath yeah. newspaper articles, so if that's okay. And then this, the woman there with the black dress, or actually, the while the mic is... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, I'll have to condense it. It touches on Newsnight, on ageism, feminism, and the image that women project. Just Sorry. If you can, um, quick question, though, because yeah, we really are running out of time. The question is about what you think about the Newsnight discussion where there were four leading women, the, le the woman that chaired the discussion, a leading Financial Times journalist, Gillian Tess, I think, um, an, an academic economist, and another woman... Um, who was from a city background, all discussing the euro and the financial situation. And the problem, I should have been very pleased, and I was, they weren't there as women, they weren't token women, they were there for their minds, their experience. The way they were dressed, legs and heels like that, all of them were so distracting. Are you saying the question Television, is... The question is, are they told how to dress? Or is this an individual thing? Right. Because television is a visual medium, and despite the... I mean, I'm confessing, I feel embarrassed to say this, that I had a problem with it, and that I'm saying it, but it shows how complicated sure. the situation is. Thank you. Um, Yasmin, the first one, I think you can both have just really quick answers. Well, for the, well, it's a big topic. Hang on, wait. 
Yasmin, on, I think online misogyny is what you're talking well, about. Well, so I, I mean, in a nutshell, Yasmin, women get a lot more abuse in this country if we're columnists or in the public eye. If you're a non-white woman, I mean, I was traumatized last year. So, were my, so was my daughter, and I nearly quit. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to quit. Why would I quit? So I've stopped reading it. The only way I survive is I never look at it anymore. Uh, but it is pretty, and there, there are campaigns here, but whether they've got anywhere, I don't know. <coughs> In a sentence, they would most definitely not have been told how to dress. No one is ever asked that. When you are phoned up and booked as a guest on any programme on the 24-hour news channel where I work, wouldn't even, wouldn't even come into it. I mean, it, you know, that would be how they are. They would have some makeup applied unless they really objected, but that is to do with... Believe me, you really don't want to be on telly really, really shiny. You don't want to be shiny. It's not a good look. And it's as simple as that. Runke. And I often wear heels like that. It, does, it doesn't define me. Um, and with that final note, I would like to thank our panellists, Yasmin Alibi-Brown, Ronke Phillips and Jane Hill. Thank you very much. And also, I should, I should also say, I should also say Jude Kelly and the organisers of WOW, because this is the most amazing festival. It was great. Well done. Well done. <laughs>